When I first came to ESP, I had on the surface something that seemed to be like the perfect life or a pretty good life. Like superficially, materialistically, I was very successful. I had the job, I had the dog, I had the car, I had the boyfriend, I had the blah, 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 the clothes, everything that I thought I needed in order to be okay. And yet, I couldn't stand to be with my family for more than two hours at a time. And the idea of being honest with even my best friend was something that was so far outside the realm of possibility that I just kind of thought you always lived your life inauthentically. Um, and when I came to ESP and I started to do the work in the Coles Lab, do the work in the classes, I started to transform in a way that I never expected. Like I literally didn't know that you could spend time with someone and not be nervous. I literally didn't know that it was possible to have a, a week with your family where you didn't feel like leaving. <laughs> I just thought that that wasn't really possible. I thought it happened in the movies. And now that's my life, that's my reality. I have an experience of my family that is nothing but joy. And it's, it's astounding. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Happy Saturday, everyone wanted to come on and talk about Nexium because I feel like the story is taking on mythic mythic levels <laughs> or it's being taken over and going into directions that may not be so accurate. I, of course, followed the Nexium story from the courtroom from the early hearings on. So one of the ways that it's become mythic is it's all become about Keith Ranieri, that one guy kind of did it all. And just a reminder that originally we, we were looking at six defendants, Kathy Russell on the left, who was going to be the fall woman. She was the accountant. Of course, Keith Ranieri in the middle Nancy Salzman, who was the number two in Nexium, also known as the number two neurolinguistic programming expert, which is a kind of verbal hypnosis used by Tony Robbins and taught by Tony Robbins, Awaken the Giant Within, if you've ever seen those commercials. Bottom left, Allison Mack was a defendant. Lauren Salzman, Nancy Salzman's daughter. And Far right of your screen, you're going to see Claire Bronfman, who is the Seagram's heiress, who funded this cult. Now, a cult doesn't have any meaning legally. It's not illegal to be in a cult. It's not illegal to start a cult. So the trial was really about a criminal enterprise, and that's what it was called. But what I wanted to share with you in the opening is Allison Mack giving her speech because it's so much like Keith Ranieri, the way Keith Ranieri talks, and to look at her so thin. And that is one thing that he insisted on is that all the women felt that women should be around, usually the right weight was around 100 pounds. And he insisted that they be on really low-calorie, vegan, plant-based diets. And so when I first came into the hearings, so they were backed by Claire Bronfman's money. She spent $13 million funding. I think it may have been a little bit more. It may have been $13 million and change. So around that, funding everyone's defense team. And in the early hearings, there was an attitude like, we're going to beat this. We're a united front. And they'd come in, Allison, Nancy, and with all these like huge team of lawyers, I always thought of Jaws, 
Like we're going to need a bigger boat. We're going to need a bigger table for all these lawyers because they literally, to use Alison Mack's word in that clip, literally didn't fit all at the defense table, a huge table. That's how many lawyers. And Claire Bronfman was once again funding it all. She also funded the retaliatory lawsuits. So they would go after their enemies by suing them to death. Didn't matter if that Nexium won. It just, what mattered to them was the punitive effects of such lawsuits, holding on to your losing money, holding on to your sanity, the stress. And that's what they did to their enemies, such as Rick Allen Ross, the cult expert, Tony Natale, Susan Dones, just to name a few of the people that they sued with Claire Bronfman's money. They also had plans to get people into Mexico and get them arrested on trumped up charges and try to put them in prison where Nexium had a lot of money. A lot of the money came from Mexico. And Keith Ranieri's ultimate goal was to take over Mexico politically. So in those early hearings, when they came in, Allison Mack, Lauren Salzman, and Claire Bronfman just had a look that I've never seen in a human being before. So sick, like a kind of gray, their skin was a kind of gray and green that I've never seen before in a human being. So emaciated. And they were come in with an attitude like they were going to the movies, going out to coffee. They would laugh and joke. And it was like nothing like this law, like like they were facing serious, serious charges. And it was like, I didn't, it, it was so odd to watch the difference in their demeanor and the seriousness of the charges against them. You're like the disparity between the two. You're like, what is going on here? And what happened was, and so that was, they put on a united front and we had many, many hearings. Then we had Curcio hearings. So the fact that Claire Bronfman was paying for everybody's lawyer had to be worked out legally was did that was was everybody getting a fair defense and they had to all have their own cursio hearings then it had to be determined with another judge which communications could be used against them and which were considered privileged because they basically nexium was saying that every all the communications between the them were privileged and that judge was really interesting because she was very Defendant friendly, I think that's the nicest way I can put it. And it was shocking because Nicholas Garifus, who was the judge on the on the other side of the trial, just working out just sort of the general criminal charges, and he presided over Keith Ranieri's trial, was the most perceptive judge I've ever seen in my life. He could pick out someone giving a look in the gallery and throw them out. He called out Claire Bronfman for manipulating one of one of the women she victimized in her victim impact statement with she was using kind of Nexium techniques and he just made her stop immediately in the middle. And he said, I saw when you started talking, your victim had a Sylvie had a reaction to it. And you know, you you can't manipulate survivors in this courtroom forget it he's like this judge isn't blind i get goosebumps thinking about it but that's something i totally missed so what happened was so we're going through all these hearings for a long long time it seemed like maybe maybe over a year before keith ranieri's trial and then one day we get word that nancy salzman the number two is pleading out. So when Nancy Salzman was arrested, they found $520,000 in cash in her home. 
in shoeboxes, some of it in Mexican money, some of it in Russian money. So it wasn't just a sex cult. It was really a also a kind of multi-level marketing scheme where they sold classes. So they, so you heard Allison Mack in the opening talking about ESP. So what is ESP? ESP is Executive Success Program. And it has a SASH system. So all... So you have to bow to your teacher coming in, right? And of course, they normalize that by saying, and you have to refer to Keith Ranieri as Vanguard and Nancy Salzman as prefect. And they normalize that by having an exercise saying, what are some of the titles that we use in life? Oh, well, we call judges your honor. So they're trying to get any kind of gut instinct that this is kind of weird and wrong. They're trying to quell that, calm you, make it okay, make you accept it, right? And of course, so you come in and you wear a white sash. And of course, Keith Ranieri always wore a white sash because he was the eternal student. And of course, he claimed he had a 240 IQ. I'll circle back that to that in a second. Then you would move up to coach where you would wear a yellow sash. Orange were proctors, which means you could earn money or commission selling classes or teaching classes. Green mean you were meant you were a senior proctor, means you had taken many intenses and probably had put in a million of your own dollars in classes, if not trade for work. Blue, you would be a counselor. Purple, senior counselor. And the gold sash, you can see Nancy Salzman on the left wearing it, was saved for the prefect. That was her name. She went by prefect. And Keith Ranieri went by vanguard. And what happened at these early hearings, one of the things was that Claire Bronfman would switch out lawyers. And in the middle of her kind of going to these hearings, she took on Mark Garagos as a lawyer and Tiny, a teeny, tiny, I, I, not teeny, I think it is, Garagos represented Keith Ranieri. And when she was asked how she got Mark Garagos as a lawyer, and uh, she said, I looked him up in on Google. That's how I found him. Then Mark Garagos comes to court the next week and he's like, he puts his hands on Claire Bronfman's shoulders and he says, oh, I've known little Claire since she was a girl. <laughs> and so she got in a lot of trouble for that. And right in the middle as she's answering questions. So Michael Avenatti and Mark Garagos were representing Claire and they were trying to work out a deal with the government to trade what they knew about Nike, some kind of what they claimed was criminal behavior by Nike to exchange it for a lesser sentence for Claire at that time. But Claire didn't, uh, didn't announce that these were her new lawyers, wasn't open about all this stuff to the judge, and she started to get chewed out by the judge. As she's getting chewed out, we were hearing white noise. There's a a meeting between the all the lawyers as she's going back to her defense table her knees buckle she holds on to a chair and she faints next thing i know i'm looking at claire bronfman on a gurney sitting straight up with her toes her patent leather loafers toes pointing upwards smiling beaming and that was the end of it. She didn't have to answer any questions for the day. But what happened with that whole Nike thing is that Michael Avenatti got in a lot of trouble for what Nike called was trying to extort Nike. And that was a big bust for Claire Bronfman. A lot of people don't know that little piece of Nexium history, right? That was Connections. 
So when Nancy Salzman pled out before the superseding indictment came down with the really serious charges, she got three and a half years. And then they all fell like dominoes, pleading out one after another, except for Keith Raniere. And Keith Raniere was determined to fight these charges. And it seemed like he really, according to Tony Natale, he really loved the O.J. Simpson trial. He was like his eyes were peeled to every minute of it. And he was very much like what we saw in Charles Adelson's trial, handing post-it after post-it to his defense attorney, really in control of his defense. And in uh, another interesting thing, in the early hearings, he came in kind of looking Manson-esque. He had dyed his hair, this kind of black. Many people thought it might have been dyed with ballpoint pens. It didn't reflect the light. But by court, he was like cleaned up, ready to go in these kind of Menendez pastel colored v-neck sweaters and the first wit one of the first witnesses was someone if you've seen the vow that you'll be familiar with on the left of our screen in the wearing the green sash mark vicente and when he got up on the witness stand he was shown the statement that was read at the beginning of every Nexium or ESP class. And he started to cry. And he was asked, why, why are you having that emotional reaction? And Mark Vicente said, it's a fraud. It's a lie. This well-intentioned veneer cover, covers horrible evil. And I think that's something that was lost in the vow because those filmmakers weren't there for the early hearings. They came in for Keith Ranieri's trial. And I think they had the idea that they were going to do some kind of documentary like Wild Wild Country, where they would look at the good and the bad, the pros and the cons. Well, in Nexium, I would argue that nobody went in and came out better than, the, than they went in. They only got worse. And besides for all the crimes that were done, besides all the kind of um, sex crimes that were done, there was also the imprisonment of the women, the starving, the coercive control. It's a really high control group. There were cameras. Um, in, so this all took place in Albany, New York. And there were cameras looking out and, and looking in. And Mark Vicente was the videographer for, for the group. He was the Lenny Reifenstahl of Nexium. And before he was in Nexium, he was in the Ramtha cult. And he made this documentary called What the Bleep Do We Know? Which seems to be a documentary on its surface just about spirituality, and where, whether you can look at spirituality as a kind of, does it, is it consistent with science, what we know from science? So he left the Ramtha cult and then went right into Nexium. So when he left Nexium, he took with him all of his videotapes. So if you're wondering why he's the star of the vow and why he's the hero of the vow, one of the reasons why is because he had all the footage. And people like Rick Allen Ross and Tony Natale were sort of made sort of lesser figures in this who had been fighting this cult for years and years and years. And Catherine Oxenberg, who was a whose daughter India and Oxenberg got roped into this cult, were sort of demoted to kind of lesser roles. And I'm not saying that Mark Vicente wasn't important in bringing down Nexium. His testimony was awesome. He's just not the sole crusader, nor is, um, let me see if I can, Sarah, so uh, Sarah Edmondson and her husband, Nippy. So Sarah Edmondson came in as a single woman. And you know, you don't, you know, it's almost, it's near impossible to be involved in Nexium and not be a victim of Keith Ranieri. Um, he preyed on all the women. 
he made it a mission. Um, even lesbian women like Kristen Snyder, who supposedly took her own life in a very sus canoe accident. She was a survivalist. She left a note behind. Um, Mark Vicente testified that Keith Ranieri told him that Kristen Snyder was still alive, living in a motel with her girlfriend, and that it was all a kind of ruse by the anti-Nexium government or people to make Nexium look bad. But in reality, Kristen Snyder might have been pregnant. She was might have been causing some trouble. It's just a big question mark as to what happened with Kristen Snyder. And I hope someday that cold case will be solved. So Sarah Edmondson comes in as a single woman and starts dating within the Nexium, um, you know, group. Her husband Nippy was involved in it, and she, of course, was one of the women who were branded with a cauterizing tool. So it's a, not like a tattoo. That's what the defense tried to argue. That it was just like a tattoo, et cetera, et cetera. And because she's an actress, she also is really good at presenting the information and being in front of the camera, right? So it's just sort of getting a little out of balance. I think, you know, I'm very appreciative of what they did to bring this cult down, but are they the, you know, most important people in the story? I don't know. I don't think so. Not according to me, not my view of it. And I think the second season of The Vow is just shameful. What they traded away to not talk about in order to interview Nancy Salzman, I would think they agreed not to talk about the fright experiments, which were, let me see, how can I say this in a YouTube-friendly way? Basically, they were experimenting with electrodes on people's minds and making them watch the worst things you can think of like faces of death kinds of things. That's the best way I can put it. And recording their reactions. I mean, that's kind of like Nazi, <laughs> Nazi stuff. And Keith Ranieri himself was absolutely a ped, interested in children sexually. And that was one of the many charges of which he was convicted of in under five hours. The jury convicted him. And he is now doing 120 years in prison. But what was so amazing about Nexium is how extraordinary the people who were involved in the cult, either, so circling back to Keith Ranieri's 240 IQ, that is to believe to be have taken by one of his child, one of the children he had relations with. She took this take home IQ test and got a 240 on it. The woman, Danny, was part of a family who moved from Mexico to Albany to, to participate in Nexium and be a part of it. And she did the horrible crime of falling in love with a, another man that wasn't Keith Ranieri. And for that, she was isolated into a room in a house where she could hear her parents and her siblings living all life all around her. She just had a mattress and a pen and a paper. And every day she wrote, I will be better. I'll fix this ethical breach. And every day, the, just let me out of the room. And every day, the answer was no. The teeth in the back of her mouth, tooth in the back of her mouth began to rot. And she begged to see a dentist. And was refused until it cracked in two, or until it started to crack. And she had to get a root canal. And she said getting that root canal and going out into the world was one of the best days of her life during that time. So that will tell you. Eventually, they threw her back to Mexico with no papers where she had to le live hand to mouth. And now she's running a whole company. But she is actually a real genius. And she would draw these amazing like 
cartoons of her life, of life on, I think she called it the Walden Times, until they told her she couldn't make them anymore. So they were like little cartoonish newspapers of what was going on. And she, her job was to read all of the books and summarize them for Keith Raniere because she could understand them. So what, if I want you to get anything from this episode, it's that Keith Raniere was the ultimate at finding people and sucking their talents and their energies out for his own use. And he's really quite a schlubby, average day, antisocial personality, very sadistic. And I thought we'd look at together this interview he did with Alison Mack. And not to pick too much on Alison Mack, she, of course, was a DOS master. So that was the sorority Keith Raniere. Basically, it was a harem of women that Keith Raniere could sleep with. And with the idea, it, it increasingly demoralizing and devaluing ways and justify it as some kind of noble action on their part. But people ask me, how did he do this with such with basically your average intelligence, no talents, no morals, nothing. And this is will give you an idea how he did it. So they're talking in this. This is so she's supposed to be interviewing him, but this is where he turns the table and starts asking Alice and Mac about being nervous on stage or having stage fright. It's because I said like after 30 years of acting, I still get so nervous sometimes when I'm about to do something that I can't. <laughs> they say that about the, you know, I, I believe the best actors and, and athletes and ethicists or whatever it is mm -hmm. have a degree of, a, a strong degree of, of weight and insecurity going into something. Now they say Barbara Streisand is extremely, has extreme straight stage fright. I think George Soros, the investor said, if he, thinks he understands an investment completely and doesn't see a way that it would fail. Mm. He feels very insecure indeed. Mm. He has to see the uncertainty to feel good about it. It's interesting that you say that because I, I definitely find that insecurity keeps. So here's a little idea how he did it. He turned his head to the side, looked into these women's eyes, and he listened. That's how he did it. And he picked up on their insecurities, their dreams, and he found ways to control them. Now, Allison Mack, when she got into Nexium, had a pretty good career. She was on Smallville, and Keith Raniere convinced her to leave all that behind and that the only real art was to be on stage and get involved in Nexium. So she she went from being having a successful TV series to being a DOS master. And the things she did were extremely cruel. And she did 18 months, which I thought was ridiculously light sentence for her role in this, but okay. You know, you get lighter sentences when you plead out. But the Nancy Salzman was the smartest move because she got in before the superseding indictments got three and a half years, and of course she's serving them now in um, Misery Mountain, I think the place is called, low-level security prison in Kentucky. But let's take a, a little bit more of a listen to this. Sharp, like, it, mm -hmm. like keeping a room a little cold. It's like mm -hmm. it keeps you awake. But there's a difference between that kind of insecurity that drives focus and then the kind of insecurity that paralyzes expression. Well, you're, I think you're confusing insecurity with the effects of insecurity. Uh -huh. Like, do you know what I'm going to say right now? No. You're insecure about that. Yeah. Is that scary for you? No. Why not? Because I trust that what you're going to say is going to be good. And, and be in the end, you're going to be okay. Be fine. Yeah. When we have insecurities, and this relates to vulnerability, uh -huh. where we think we may not be okay, then it becomes scary. See, it's not the insecurity 
that's the problem. It's the fear of the insecurity mm -hmm. and not even fear as in an excited. So does any of this make any sense? It's not the fear. It's the idea of the fear. I mean, it's just mumbo jumbo. And he just, if he said it softly and like he was really thinking about it. And because he already had the prop of the 240 IQ and the Dalai Lama, the blessings of the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama was paid either one or two million dollars to endorse Nexium. Came to Albany and shook hands and and extolled the virtues of the program. This was all set up by Claire Bronfman. She flew Keith and the crew with private planes down there. So what I'm saying is it took a lot of money to not only just Claire's money, but a lot of other people looking the other way or taking their money and saying, well, you know, it's doing good. People say they're getting better, but no one got better. They only got worse in ways that took, you know, maybe they'll never, some of these people will never be the same again. And so Keith liked to sleep late, eat, 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 you know, carb heavy food, but he insisted on his followers eating very little, sleeping very little and working all the time. So he just like kind of led a life of leisure in Albany. Fear, like a roller coaster fear. Mm -hmm. It's fear as in a terrorized fear. Yeah. Um, and you can, of course, um, recognize that excitement isn't really fear in the same way. And that when we talk about fear as in a fight or flight fear, it's a certain type of a thing, mm -hmm. but it's not the insecurity. Insecurity doesn't bother you. Insecurity, you know, is wonderful. If everything, you could predict everything, it'd be pretty dull and then we'd be robots again. Well, know? yeah. And like what you were saying about unpredictability versus predictability and creativity, like you need mm -hmm. a sense of insecurity. Mm -hmm. non-predictability so so he convinced her that she was going to be a great stage actress and of course on v week every year they had a v week which was the during the week of keith ranieri's birthday where they all got together and celebrated you know the executive success program and many people got into it thinking that this would be a real way to earn money and like allison mack you know, their finances all went to, and all their energy and all their time went to Nexium. She was living in Albany. She was full, full time doing this when she got arrested. She was absolutely committed. And this is, I think, one of the more interesting things when Allison Mack sang to Keith Ranieri during B Week. Let's take a look at that. Oh, wait, hold on one second. That's just a picture. I actually have the whole thing. Hold on one sec. So these are all people who are all involved in Nexium singing to Allison Mack singing to Keith Ranieri. So he really was envisioning for her a great stage career. And this was her way of proving that she could be authentic. Nexium liked to use the word authentic. They also used to like to use the word um, ethics, ethical. They all had to be ethical and you had to fix their ethical breaches. So much of it was stolen from Scientology. Even right down to the words, you know, the phrases right ripped right out of the book. Well, you know, I hurt myself as well. 
Is that any way for a woman to carry on? Do you think I want my thoughts going on? Is that the
Okay. That's just such a, you know, I look at that and I get that same sick feeling in the pit of my stomach that I got when I was going to the hearings. I'm looking at a extremely malnourished, exhausted, overworked, coercively controlled group of people, especially Alice and Mac there. And that is one of the reasons that they do those kind of things, control your diet, control your sleep, keep you overworked, keep you sleepless so that you're not thinking rationally and you're thinking emotionally. And she's bringing up, you know, so the, all those emotions are really raw and to the surface. And of course, she's working hard to prove that she's authentic and real on stage and really showing herself. And it just it really does look like, you know, a kind of naked, raw person on stage. And is she a victim? Yes. Is she a victimizer? Yes. In the story. So, you know, you kind of have to be comfortable with the discomfort uh, of, of that duality. So she's, she was both. And because this is a group that used hypnosis in the form of neurolinguistic programming so much, Tony Natale has the theory that the people that stayed, so many people took executive success classes. She feels that the small percentage that stayed like Allison Mack and that got really involved in Nexium and ESP, like Mark Vicente and Sarah Edmondson, were people who were very susceptible. There's like a 10% of the population that's very susceptible to hypnosis and were very affected by that. So that their rational minds were were clo shut off very quickly, and that they had an emotional reaction, could be emotionally manipulated in the ways that Nancy Salzman and Keith Ranieri and the head of Nexium wanted them to. But all, you know, some of the things were also financial crimes. They brought in workers from. Oh, they brought in people from Mexico and promise them things and basically use them as, as slaves. That's part of one of the charges that Claire Bronfman is doing. Long prison sentence. I think it's seven and, seven and three quarters of a year prison for. And she got the most time because the judge wisely, way more than the recommended sentence, and, the, and that was his right to give her way more than the, max, the, the recommended sentence, is because her money funded it. But so while this was so after Keith Ranieri got convicted, Keith Ranieri went right, just like Charlie Adelson did, went right to the wrongful conviction movement. And there's communications that came out saying we got to get on Jason Flom, whose money he's he founded Lava Records. His money helped build the Innocence Project. He has the Wrongful Conviction podcast where he has a new wrongfully convicted, quote unquote, LOL, person on every week to share their story, really pushing this forward. He got Marty Tankliff, and I highly recommend my episode, Did Keith Ranieri's Lawyer, Marty Tankliff, Kill His Parents, where I went through, it took about a couple years on and off to make that episode of researching, finding everything we could get our hands on, reading about. So he's a person who got his sentence overturned on a technicality, announced exoneration, that he was exonerated and got his law, you know, got his law degree, passed the bar, now teaches, leads classes to investigate solve, solved crimes. So he was Keith Ranieri's lawyer and he was going to do some kind of contest where he would give $35,000 to anyone who could find the holes in the government's theory. So this was a federal case. So it was the government against, right, the United States versus, versus Ranieri. Weirdly, weirdly, right after that, Amanda Knox came out saying that Keith Ranieri's conviction should be looked at, that he should, that he's perhaps wrongfully convicted. And all of a sudden, all over the press, Amanda Knox is saying that Keith Ranieri was wrongfully convicted. So what happened there? 
and the contest was no longer. So we don't know what went on behind the scenes, but if I had to guess, I would have to guess that she was proposed. You know, they made some kind of deal. That's my own theory. It's not fact. It's just a theory. Just in the chain of events are very weird. But they also joined other people who had loved ones in prison to dance in front of Keith Ranieri's prison for his freedom. So these, so after he was convicted, many loyalists like Nikki Klein and Michelle Hatchett, who were ma DOS masters, stayed loyal. And no matter how, how much people tried to get them rational and out of it, and they would dance on the, um, at night in front of the in front of the prison. So let's take a look at that with other people, with other family members who had with other people who had Oh yeah, this is when their their group was called We Are As You, which is such a perfect expression of Keith Ranieri's weird gobbledygook speech. <laughs> and I think then they became something else. They changed their name. So my name is Eduardo Asuncelo, and I'm one of the founders of uh, The Forgotten Ones. We come and we dance for the people inside of MDC Brooklyn. Because of COVID, they, have ha they haven't had visits in like six months, almost. July 3rd was the first day that we came. Uh they do this to bring joy to prisoners. Not if They're definitely not dancing for their cult leader, who is... Who, who may be seen by some as a sexual pervert. That's not that's not what they're doing, guys. Not what they're doing at all. Um, so it's been, I guess, almost 20 days in a row, every day, eight to nine. Uh, and from inside, we get reports that the morale is up, that there's less violence, that they have something to uh, look forward to, which seems to be really, really good for them. So you see like a real discrepancy in class. So here are the, you know, Nexium really targeted people with money. You had to have money to take these classes. And of course, they're hanging out with people of a much, much lower class. And it's a kind of interesting little mix of of, of classes that you of class that you don't often see in America. Uh, my friend in there is Keith, Keith Ranieri. I was a teacher in Nexium for 10 years, um, which, you know, that's why we didn't want at first to say who we were because we knew it was going to be done, it was going to be made about these things. We have a friend who is incarcerated here. He's been here since March 2000. Congratulations to Nikki Klein for leaving, leave, finally leaving the cult. Good for you. But often what happens is when people leave cults, they go right into someone who's just, they run to someone who's just as abusive or just as coercively controlling or to another group. So I hope she's keeping herself safe and free. 2018, as you do with people that you've known for a long time, you have inside jokes. And one of my party tricks is doing a moonwalk. So I did a moonwalk and a bunch of guys sort of banging on their windows. Um, so we we're like, oh, that, that's probably fun for them to see. It's probably not every day that they, that they see that. And um, it, it evolved to, to turning on the car stereo and dancing and like shining our lights and waving. You know, I took 
classes for, for many years with Executive Success Programs, which is uh, affiliated with Nexium. I think what's really sad is that we are out here doing something really good um, that is helping a lot of people. And people can't get past this idea that we were in something called a sex cult, which I don't even know what that is. I certainly was never part of a sex cult. Right. I was just a branded slave master. Come on, guys. <laughs> it's just sad to me. I'm really happy she's out. But of course, you notice that the women are, 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 get, are the only ones getting scantily clothed here. And that was another thing that was pushed was this kind of differences between men and women. And men had their own group to make them more masculine called the Society of Protectors. And women were supposed to learn how to become in their own group, how to become less naggy and complaining and support men more in their masculinity. But it also sort of hitched on to some ideas of sex positive feminism and really what I'd call extreme fetishistic sex was also incorporated in Nexium as some kind of, you know, obviously with DOS, you have slave master, that kind of thing into some kind of experience for women that would help them grow. So all of this, like I watched this and it's just interesting to me, you know, setting up, I was, you know, getting myself organized for this live. I was so intent on having a structure to the episode that I, I didn't have time for any of the feelings, but I'm getting all the same kind of sick, upset feelings that I got in court and just feeling like this is so dangerous. What this thank, thank heaven, you know, thank you to everyone who helped bring down this, this cult. It was so dangerous. And I'm not sure if people got that from the vow, especially the way that they kept honing in on all the good they did. And there you hear Nikki Klein ringing home that theme. And that was Keith Ranieri's defense. He had good intent. Nothing. Uh, no one came out better. If they did some small good in a small way, it was nothing in comparison to the amount of destruction caused by Keith Ranieri, Nancy Salzman, and the, and Claire Bronfman, the, you know, the people that led this movement for years and years, led this cult for years and years, unstopped. And it looked like it would never be stopped until Catherine Oxenberg really started putting her face out there and going on talk show after talk show and talking about the branding that her daughter, I mean, all these people are branded. Everyone, all the women you're looking at here in Nexium, Michelle Hatchett, Nikki Klein, they're all branded with a cauterizing tool. So that's that. I mean, they talk about the smell of of burning coming from it. So I'm trying to talk about it in a way. I'm hoping you can put together what was burning. It's not a tattoo. And people like Joe Rogan were saying, well, how do we know that these aren't just women who are into this and that this wasn't some kind of club of women who were sexually free? And Alex Jones, same thing. It's just interesting that Alex Jones is now supporting the Tate brothers and lying for them. And, you know, why was he so skeptical when the story broke of uh, Nexium? Why was he so concerned? Why was he so sure that the government got it wrong? Do you guys have questions? I think, I mean, that's really, I can touch back on this another day. But if anyone has any questions, I'll just sort of hang out for a second. I think I showed you everything I had. Actually, you know what? I'll show you one more thing before I go. I have one more thing. So Keith Ranieri had this idea just quickly. It's just really funny. The way Mark Vicente testified about this was really funny. So he had this idea that if we could look at the news rationally and get the emotion out of our media, that it would be a good thing. And he's like, but 
you know, what Mark Vicente said on the stand, and I am paraphrasing very loosely, but he was making the point, like, once you take the emotion out, you have nothing. So like, so all you have is like something happened to someone, you know, um, you know, ferocious dog bites small child. So once you have you have a dog bit, you know what I mean? You're just like, so he was very interested in kind of taking out the emotion. So, and that, I believe the point of that was so that people wouldn't, when they were having emotional reactions, could rationalize them and push themselves away from it. So here's, and this, are, I think this was put up, I'm not sure, but by Keith Ranieri's current supporters, he still has followers. Now, of course, they're not supposed to talk to them, but they find a way through his lawyers. He, one of the conditions or uh, parts of Keith Ranieri's sentence is that he should have no contact with anyone related to Nexium, but they all seem to find a way to communicate with him, either by dancing in front of his, how do they all know to show up in front of his prison and dance? And I'm sure that was all their idea, right? So let's just take a quick look at it. Well, the least important article is the article that most people read out of 100 people, 99 people read it, and they have no reaction to it whatsoever, and they won't even remember it. An article that's not as important as the most important articles are, some people have feelings about it, and they're different feelings. The most important articles are you have the majority of people having the same feeling. So that's a very um, influential, consistently influential article. That's an ethical article, but the question is what's the morality under the ethics? Mm -hmm. So um, that's a, an interesting thing. So I rate articles, I try to rate articles that way, which means I read them and I imagine myself as all different types of people relating to the different premises that I perceive and the different characters within the article. And I, I see the feeling weight. So what's the morality under the ethics? Are there different kinds? I mean, is he suggesting there are different kinds of morality? So I guess he's suggesting that there's different kinds of morality different than the kinds of morality that we, the moral things we all agree on, like the Ten Commandments. So I really, if, if you're interested in the Nexium story, I highly recommend Tony Natale's book. I highly recommend Sarah Berman's book, Don't Call It a Cult. Highly recommend the documentary Seduced. I really thought if you don't want to read Seduced, I thought was excellent. Even though it's just India's story, I think it really covered so much more of the story than just Keith Ranieri likes to play volleyball at midnight with his followers. Isn't that weird? Or, you know, some of the more <laughs> some of the more eccentric things about that group. But if I if I want to leave you with anything is that if you are listening to this and you think that this could never happen to you, you might be right. This might not, you might not have been susceptible to this group, but anyone is susceptible to these high control groups. If they come into your life at a vulnerable time, if they target your vulnerabilities and that these were some of the best people that you'd want to know, some of the most talented, compassionate, interesting, talented, I say it again, talented people you'd ever want to know. And it was all kind of sucked up for the purposes and used for the purposes of Keith Ranieri to have control over people, to have wealth. I mean, he really wanted to rule next. That was their next their next stop was to rule Mexico. So thank you very much to the great Mora Penza, Tanya Hajar, and the rest of the New York prosecutors who brought this group down. That's what I have for today. I'll see you back here at six where I'm going to be going over the Adelson family. Sympathy for the devil. Don't miss it. I'll see you there. Have a great day.
day, everybody.